Five factors that contribute to foodborne illness, improper cooking, temperature abuse, lack of hygiene, that's largely hand washing, cross-contamination, food from unsafe sources. We're gonna go through a couple of these and then we're gonna see what we can do about them. We talked about hand washing. Did I show you this cheese plant stuff? So you saw my kid looking gross? Yeah, okay. And John Stewart? Yeah. And you've seen those? Did you ever read those? Did any of you read those in the bathrooms? We didn't have any control over the location. It was just wherever they were. Personally, I would have preferred it over top of the urinal because then you got a 20 second learning opportunity or in the back of the door. There was a norovirus outbreak at the University of Guelph in Canada. There's been norovirus outbreaks pretty much every week at some campus for the last year. What happens when you get norovirus? Barf a lot. The one at Georgetown last fall was pretty good. They had some live blogging from the student paper. And they were talking about there were so many kids, they had overrun emergency, and they were all just sitting in the hallway in emergency barfing everywhere, causing everyone else to barf, just like out of one of those movies. Um, they did a, we, got, we did some research at Guelph, and they, you know, the administration would say things like, well, we put out a press release so students would know about it. Who reads press releases, right? If you want to get to students, how do you got to put the information out? Text messaging, which is what they do now. And what were you going to tell them? You're going to tell them you got to make sure you have the right tools and use it. It turns out that at Guelph, six months before this, this is in one of the residences, one of the administrators decided it would be a good idea to take the soap and paper towel out of the bathrooms. So on each floor, there's a communal bathroom and they were, it was argued they were losing money because students were stealing the stuff. So they decided to take the soap and the paper towel out. So every time you went to the bathroom, you had to take your own soap and towel. And not surprisingly, they had a norovirus outbreak in which a couple hundred people got sick. They now have soap and paper towel back. They also looked at some new messages and this is the poster we came up with to target students because you never know what other people have been dealing with. <laughs> Gets the message across. Not going to work with all audiences, but for students and the YouTube generation, it seems the yuckier the better. I don't know why. So speaking of yuck, would you eat that? Why not? Because it's not cooked. How do you know? How do you know it's not cooked? Because it looks fresh and pink. All right. How can you tell if something is cooked? Temperature. This is fully cooked. You may not like the look of it, but that red has to do with the age that the chick was harvested. This chicken has been cooked to 165 degrees Fahrenheit as verified by a digital tip sensitive thermometer. Color is a lousy indicator. How many people use a thermometer when they cook a chicken breast or a hamburger? Do you really? All the time? Yeah? How come? Because <laughs> you're a food safety guru, right? All right. <laughs> well, that's the right answer. How many, what percentage of Americans do you think use a thermometer when they cook a hamburger? It's less than 1%. It's probably 0.0001%. Yet research done by Melvin Hunt, whose office is just up there 10 years ago, showed that almost 60% of all hamburgers will turn brown before they are fully cooked. Again, has to do with the age of the animal, the myoglobin composition in the meat. You need to use a thermometer. You can go see our video of us wandering around tailgating at a game, talking to drunk kids who were cooking chicken wings and hamburgers. <laughs> the best was when we asked one kid, how do you know when it's done? And he goes, when it's effing delicious. <laughs> 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 I 
I then proceeded to put a meat thermometer into his wings, and he's like, you saved my life, because it was only 135, and they were raw chicken wings. If you're going to go tailgating, and you're going to be having some pops, and you're not going to pay attention to how you cook, get pre-cooked stuff. That's, you know, idiot proof. <laughs> it's a lot easier. But you got to look at labels. How do you know when you go to the grocery store if you're buying raw frozen stuff or cooked frozen stuff? Did you eat these pot pies? Do you know there was an outbreak on them two years ago in which 400 people got salmonella? Do you know that the company, when this outbreak was announced, it was during the day, and they said, there's a bunch of people sick with salmonella. And Phoebus and I were out, actually, with dinner with some people. And we heard about this outbreak. And after dinner, I went with my wife, and we went to Dylan's, and we bought 50 of these things, because they were still there. Because the company, in its glory, the company was ConAgra, the company said, as long as consumers follow the instructions, they don't have anything to worry about. I thought, all right. So we went and bought 50 of them. They're still sitting in Dr. Phoebus's freezer over in Call Hall, if we ever want to do some cooking experiments with them. I took one, and because uh, this was, you know, all across the country. Company says just follow. So I followed the instructions on my microwave, because it was microwavable, and I took pictures. And I used a thermometer. What's a, these are turkey and chicken pot pies, so what temperature do they have to get to? To control salmonella, 165. I followed the instructions, and that's how hot it got, 136. I did this in 10 minutes in my own kitchen, took pictures, put it on my blog, and then it gets picked up by the New York Times. And the company recalls product. Now, I don't think they did it because of this, but the company and I have had some interesting interactions. <laughs> And Dr. Phoebus, this was in the New York Times. Uh, Phoebus and I have done a bunch of research where we look at how people cook these things, whether it's chicken strips or chicken Kievs. And he can talk for hours about how microwave cooking doesn't really, microwaves are great for reheating. They're not so good for cooking because you get cold patches. It's not very uniform, especially the cheap ones. If you get a good enough microwave over 1,000 watts, it seems to be OK. But the ones that are 29 bucks at Walmart are probably about 600 watts, and they ain't so good. I mean, when this happened, everyone's going, you have to check the wattage of your microwave. And I'm like, I got a PhD in food science. I don't know what the wattage of my microwave is. My wife had to show me where to look. Now, maybe I should have known, but I don't think it's up to customers if for, for, who just want to eat a 50-cent pot pie when they get home from school. So you get these products. Up until a couple of years ago, you could go to Walmart or Dillon's, and these things were sold side by side. You would get raw, frozen, breaded chicken thingies, strips, nuggets, and fully cooked, frozen, breaded chicken thingies. Well, the ones that are raw, you have to cook them to 165 and make sure you get there. Are you reading your packages that closely? Now it's changed, and USDA has gotten rid of most, uh, required labeling, and the labels are a little clearer for those who pay attention. It's not so easy to get the raw, uncooked product, at least not at retail. At food service, there's a lot. But they usually deep fry it, so that takes care of the cooking. They don't microwave it. Uh, the point is, there's lots of opportunities for consumer confusion. And we took 40 people, 20 teenagers, and 20 primary meal preparers, and we put them in kitchens here at K-State. Not This is Ben's kitchen, but it's the system. And we had three cameras on them, and we watched them cook. Because when you, ask, when you do surveys, you ask people, do you wash your hands? And they say, yes, I wash my hands. Well, people lie. And in this case, one of the key findings was we did a survey after people had just finished cooking. And we would ask them things like, do you wash your hands before you prepare your food? And all of them said, yes, I do that all the time. And we had just watched half of them not do it, yet they still believed that they had done it. Four of them 
We left a meat thermometer out, but didn't tell them what to do with it. Four of them used the meat thermometer, and two of them put the meat thermometer in, looked at it, said it's done, and when we went in, the plastic case was still on the thermometer. So people knew they were supposed to use it, but they didn't know how. I'm not saying people are silly or whatever, I'm just saying it's hard to do this food safety stuff. And the instructions often are not very clear. So, with a thermometer, you need to stick it in. <laughs> Anyone know what that is? What? <coughs> carrots. Very good. These are processing carrots. That's the size of them. You know those little carrots you get in the bag? Good for you? Okay. There are not little carrot farms. <laughs> they are not located be beside the little corn on the cob farms. <laughs> they punch them out of these big things. All right? Now, when you have a HACCP system, what kind of system is that? You're looking at what kind of risks? Microbiological, physical, and chemical. So, this is a system for processing carrots. This stuff goes in to make uh, little jars of baby food, carrot baby food that parents are going to give to their babies. So, if you use a HACCP based system, what are you looking for? Are there microbiological concerns with this stuff? Not really. Uh, this all frozen food, you know, you see those ads where it, like uh, I think Green Giant's got them out now, like you know, picked at the peak of freshness and then frozen. They are, except they're cooked first. They're all blanched to destroy the enzymes so they don't degradate and to take care of microorganisms. Except one, there's one frozen commodity that isn't blanched. Do you know what it is? Because there's a recall on it right now because of salmonella. It's onions, chopped onions in the bags. They don't cook those. And there's some being recalled in California today because they got salmonella. Chemical risk, that's pretty much controlled. The risk here is physical. Can you envision what the physical risk is from this sort of harvesting system? And these are these big, enormous machines that go about a foot and a half under the ground and dig out everything. And then they shake the carrots up and they put them in there. What's the physical risk? The physical risk is kids driving up and down the back roads and tossing their glass beer bottles into the field. And then this machine comes along and shatters that glass as they harvest the carrots and then you end up with little glass fragments in someone's baby food, and that's not good. And processors work very hard to control glass and metal fragments from getting in. But for an on-farm food safety program here, we make sure we tell the farmers, go out and scout your fields. And if you're going to go shoot groundhogs or prairie dogs or whatever you have here, make sure you pick up the shells, because they will also get shattered by this machine, and you'll have metal fragments. So when you think about food safety, you use HACCP base, then you apply it to whatever system you have, okay? One group I worked a lot with over the years is greenhouse vegetables. Um, do you know where Detroit is? Okay, so across the border from Detroit and in Canada, there is a Canadian side there. It's called Windsor, and about 20 miles up from Windsor is a place called Leamington, and it's on Lake Erie. That's Lake Erie there. And there are more greenhouses in and around Leamington for vegetable production than there are in the entire United States. If you go to Dillon's today or Walmart and you look at the tomatoes, you will see there's probably some vine ripened. Bugs everywhere. Vine ripened, and they're right now from Arkansas this time of year. And then you'll see some, they call them hothouse in the U.S. In Canada, they call them greenhouse. And if you look on it, it'll say right on them, Ontario. And that's where they're from. And they control a lot of the market because they figured out how to grow them. They got really good soil. And uh, it provides, when they, they figured out that if you put it under glass or polypropylene, you get a very uniform product. And that's what food service wants, is a nice slice for a chicken sandwich or a burger or whatever. 
What, is, what food do you worry about the most when it comes to food safety today? If you're making dinner, what wor foods do you worry about in your kitchen? Chicken? Someone say chicken. What else? Pork? If you ask Americans, number one, they'll say chicken. So they know it's the riskiest food, but they keep buying more of it. But actually, the foods to worry about today are fresh fruits and vegetables. Because they're fresh, anything they come into contact with, like this damn fly, <laughs> or my hands, or bugs, or anything else from around here, has the potential to contaminate, because you don't cook them. They're good for you, you should eat more of them. But you need to be very careful how they're grown and how they're raised. And this is a huge problem because everyone today wants their food local and they want to grow it in their backyard and hey, that's fine, but you better practice some good microbiology or you're going to be eating a lot of poop. And what makes you sick? Poop. Okay. This is a greenhouse. You get the idea. These things are about 10 foot tall, these plants. How does salmonella get in tomatoes? And there's been outbreaks every year for the last 15 years. How does salmonella get in tomatoes? Well, it's where salmonella come from? Animals, birds carry salmonella, lizards. You got these little geckos in West Virginia. They're, they're, these geckos flood that every time it rains a lot. These little geckos are all over the tomatoes, and they carry salmonella. So there's lots of sources. One source is this dump tank water. The tomatoes are picked, they go into this dump tank. When you pick a tomato, you create a bunch of little micro capillaries around the calyx or the stem that you can't see. But what it means is, is that if the water temperature is not within five degrees of the interior temperature of the tomato, water is sucked inside. So whatever's in my water is now inside this tomato. Well, where are tomato farms located? Usually in the country. So where's the water coming from? A well. So what do I have to do to that water? I have to chlorinate it. I have to do something or ozonate it or something because whatever's in that water is going to be inside the tomato. See these employees working? This is an old picture. Those biofilms are all gone. Some are wearing gloves, some aren't. We asked them, why do you wear gloves? And they said, well, it keeps the green gunk off my hands. And we'd say, how often do you change your gloves? Because, I mean, are gloves a good food safety practice? If you're working in food service, should you wear gloves? Why? You all want this, so why? To reduce the risk of cross-contamination, okay. There's a problem with gloves, though. And based on observational studies, they tend to give the people wearing them a false sense of security. So it doesn't matter if I have a glove on or not. If I you know, scratch myself and then go back to making your salad, I got problems. <laughs> and it turns out it's better to wash your hands. But the customers expect you to be wearing gloves, so people will say, wear gloves anyway. But if you do wear gloves, just remember, whatever you touch is now on the glove and is then on the food. We asked these people how often you change your gloves, and they said, well, we get a new pair every year. So that wasn't very good. <laughs> That's all been changed. But fresh produce is uh, really vulnerable, and it goes back to October 1996, which is when this outbreak happened. This was the one that really put fresh produce on the map. If Jack in the Box put E. coli on the map, that was 93. Four died. 600 got sick from hamburgers. In 96, it was this one in which a 16-month-old died, and 70 got sick from E. coli 015787 7 from this juice. All right. How does E. coli 0157 get into juice? Deer poop on the apples. Very good. The company, and this is a lesson for all the outbreaks that are going on today, the company, Odwalla, used unpasteurized apple cider as its base because it didn't want to pasteurize it because it went against its natural image and it destroyed the life-enhancing enzymes or some nonsense like that. 
and had a contract with the company that supplied them with apples that said, you shall only use picked apples. That was the paper contract. The problem was they never sent a human being to confirm that they were doing what they said they were doing. Just like all those companies never sent human beings to Peanut Corporation of America to check that they were doing, that they were supposed to be doing. They relied on paperwork. You still need to send people. So yeah, they were using apples that dropped on the ground. Deer go through the apple orchards. Bambi takes a crap on the apples. The apples get harvested. They get pressed into cider. And they make little kids sick. This is uh, an example of tomatoes. Um, this is in 2004 in Pennsylvania. Sheets is a chain of convenience stores. If you, go to, if you ever drive on the interstate anywhere, you'll know that people eat all their meals now at these convenience stores on interstates. They have everything. Sandwiches, ready to go, all sorts of things. Sort of gross, but it's there. Anyway, uh, 400 people got sick with salmonella in the tomatoes in that sandwich for exactly the reason that we just described about field packing in water that was not clean. And at the time, one customer said she wasn't worried about the food at Sheets because she gets diarrhea from her own cooking all the time. <laughs> I don't think that's a good marketing slogan. <laughs> and then you have all these groups that say, you know, consumers need to be educated about how to cook. And one of them actually, after that outbreak, said that the first line of defense to reduce risk is to cook, clean, chill, and separate. Except these were ready to eat sandwiches. So I'm not sure that it would have had much effect other than if you cooked the sandwich or if you took the sandwich apart and took the tomato slice out and washed it and put it back in. And even then, you can't wash it off. So having these messages doesn't really help anybody. All right, so we've looked at a few of the risky things, you know, temperature control, which you need to verify with thermometer, hand washing, which you need to do regularly, cross-contamination is a big issue, sourcing food from safe sources, because with fresh produce, that's about all you can do. It has to be controlled on the farm, spinach, lettuce, tomatoes. You've got to prevent it in the first place because you're not going to be able to do much with it other than cooking it. But most people don't want to spend a premium on this stuff and then cook it. That crappy stuff. So, there's a lot of challenges. The U.S. has been documenting the incidence of foodborne illness, and every year they issue a report. And for the last four years, the numbers of sick people has not changed. It was changing, it was going down each year, but for the last four years, it's been stagnant. So I would argue that we need some new messages using new media and that, you know, those groups like that one I just showed you are not helping anything and they should go away <laughs> and give back their money. We target food handlers because that's an ideal population for us. There's so many meals eaten at food service that it's a good way to get at. And we can get at individuals too. One of the ways we do it is through blogging. How many of you read blogs? None? Are blogs passe already? How many of you Twitter? How many of you think Twitter is dumb? <laughs> it has its potential. Uh, the people here in media relations at K-State, they say that if they use Twitter, they get their message out a lot faster. They get a much better response, and maybe they do. Do you know who Kevin Smith is? He's the director who did Clerks and Dogma. And he's pretty funny if you want to follow him on Twitter. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what hockey is? Don't laugh. There's no arenas in this town. So the playoffs are going on right now, and Kevin Smith is in love with the New Jersey Devils because he's, he's a Jersey boy. And every year, for two years now, the NHL has hired him to blog about the Devils. And this year, he lasted one blog post. <laughs> and then the NHL said, no, you can't, because he swears a lot and things. <laughs> but he's playing, uh, New Jersey's playing Carolina, which is a team I root for, because I know the general manager, and I know a couple of the players. So Jersey won last night, won nothing. I was 
crushed, but Kevin Smith was happy. Anyway, Twitter's okay to get stuff out quick, but it is sort of dumb. Blogs are still incredibly popular. There's millions of them, and it's a good way of transmitting information if you do it the right way. We have a paper that, we, that was just published in Food Technology talking about food safety blogs and what's good and what's not. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And I don't know why, but our blog numbers have gone way up in the last month. Google does things that I don't understand, but right now we're getting over 6,000 unique visitors a day. And by unique visitors, I mean it's not me going and visiting the site 100 times. Just to boost my numbers up, I only count as one. So we're getting 6,000 a day, which is pretty good. Uh, this one, this was the most popular post we ever did, and it has all the elements of a good blog post. It involves a D-list celebrity, which is always good. In this case, it was a Tory Spelling, who was pregnant at the time. It involves pregnant people. There's n nothing like an audience who has nothing to do but sit at home and surf the internet for information. Pregnant women fit that bill. It has some food safety information and some goofiness. So Baskin and Robbins in last May decided it would be a good idea to offer free soft serve ice cream to pregnant women at six or seven stores. And I'd written about this and someone from Australia wrote me and said, that's a really bad idea because there's this huge listeria risk for pregnant women. And soft serve ice cream has a potential to develop listeria because the machines are hard to clean. So I looked around and it turns out the Americans and Canadians don't really consider the risk to be that much bigger than with any other ice cream or any other products. But in Australia and New Zealand, they actively warn pregnant women do not eat soft serve ice cream. So I wrote this up and, well, one of the celebrity blogs, TMZ, which is very popular, picked it up and has been slamming Tory Spelling ever since for giving bad advice to pregnant women. <laughs> and I did all these radio interviews and it was sort of fun. The Popeyes one was popular because it got picked up by the New York Times. Uh, I, Barack Obama, like any other politician, uh, said that the United States have, has the safest food in the world, which is not true. It may be true, but no one can prove it, so you can't say it. So I blogged about that and people paid attention to that. This inquiry, I won't go into it. And we got on Letterman for uh, Don't Eat Poop. Now I need to personally get on Letterman. All right. So in all of these things, whether it's those sheets that you see hanging in the bathrooms, like washing your hands, some of these other info sheets, whether it's a blog post, we're not just you know, making this up and pulling it out of our behinds. People learn by stories. They do not learn by facts. You'll learn by facts sitting in a classroom because you have to. But the most effective way to get someone's attention is to tell a story. Do you know what hepatitis A is? Hepatitis A is a virus. There's an outbreak every week in the United States somewhere. Now, it's only contained by humans. It doesn't come from animals or somewhere else. It's human to human. Now, if I tell you you should wash your hands before you make that salad, you'll probably shrug your shoulders and go, of course I do, and then not pay any attention to me. But if I tell you, you know, there was a kid just like you, and she went down to the Dominican for her friend's wedding or Mexico where hepatitis A is endemic and picked it up, and what happens when you pick it up is nothing for two weeks, and then for another two weeks you're actively shedding virus but you don't know it, and then after four weeks you'll turn yellow. And then you'll go to the doctor, and the doctor will say, I think your liver's got problems. And then they'll test you, and they go, oh, you have hepatitis A. And then you go back and you say, geez, I was making salads for you know, two weeks, shedding virus. And then thousands of people will have to get immunized against hepatitis A virus. This is going on in Indiana right now at an Albertsons. Guy who worked in the produce section picked up hep A. All these people are getting vaccinated. But here's the real part, because it's not just that you have hep A and have it. Hepatitis A is only transmitted through what we politely call the oral fecal route. It means 
you picked up Hep A, and then you went to the bathroom, and you didn't wash all the poop off your hands, and you put the poop on that produce, which then wasn't cooked. So maybe you should wash your damn hands. <laughs> now, that's me telling a story. Is that a more effective way of learning than just, you know, ordering, wash your hands? Well, it, it seems to be. And we have evidence that it works. And that's all true, by the way. Uh, Demi Moore threw Ashton Kushner a birthday party last year at a bar in New York and the bartender had just come back from the Dominican a few weeks earlier, and they all had to get Hep A shots because the bartender was shedding virus into the ice that he made for the drinks. See, even celebrities can barf. Actually, Jay Leno did not record a show last night. Did you know that? I know he's not funny. I don't watch him either. <laughs> but he checked into the hospital, for, and he's not taping tonight or last night and they say it's food poisoning. But they didn't say what kind. So, we have these info sheets. They did, they actually started out like this. Can you imagine anything is so boring? But we didn't know what we were doing, and that was five years ago. To something like that. That's one of our most popular pictures. Do you know who that is? No one knows who that is? We're so old. <laughs> it's Frank Zappa. <laughs> Do you know who Frank Zappa is? Or was? He's dead now. <laughs> oh, well. Look him up on uh, Wiki sometime. <laughs> so we test these things. We come out with these different designs. We send a kid to go work in food service to figure things out. Because I can tell you all the great things you're supposed to do about hand washing. And that happens, and everyone sort of practices it until it gets busy. When the lunchtime crowd comes in, everything stops. What's the one food that most health inspectors will not order at a restaurant? If you go to a restaurant in Aggieville, what's the one food that health inspectors typically would not order? Salad. Why not? That's yeah, the hands. It's actually more specific than that. What happens is there's a, usually a kid doing dishwasher cleanup and doing all the other gunk, but then when it gets busy, that kid gets pulled off dishwasher and does salad prep. And salad prep is usually just a box by the door where you grab it and throw it on a plate. The health inspectors don't like that because <laughs> the kid usually doesn't wash his or her hands before going from cleaning up gunk to doing salad prep. At, uh, do you ever, I know you probably don't eat out much because you're poor. Um, if you ever go to a, a sit-down place and you have leftovers and you ask to take them home, they give you a, bo a styrofoam thing, right? A clamshell? If the restaurant's any good, what will they do? Pardon? Tell you no. Tell you no? No, they'll give it to you. Saran wrap? No. They'll bring the, the clamshell to you and make sure that you put the food in there. Now, it used to be, it wasn't that long ago, where they would always take it back into the kitchen and put it in. What's the problem with that? You're taking all my bugs that are on that plate back into my kitchen. And number two, because I've lost sight of it, I can accuse you of anything and sue you. Because then I can go home and say, oh, your food made me sick. I don't, know, I don't know what you did back there. So the good restaurants will now make sure they give it to you and let you take care of it. Because there's been some lawsuits. Here's some example. I like to go through this one because it's a good, this is a good info sheet to provide information. There was an outbreak at, at the same time spinach was going on in 2006. Six or seven people across North America got botulism from carrot juice. Two in Georgia, two in Florida, two in Toronto, and one in Montreal, I think. How do you get botulism from carrot juice? And they all ended up in comas, by the way, because botulism isn't fun. 
All right, so you go back through microbiology. Where does Clostridia botulinum live? In the soil. Where are carrots grown? In the soil. So you got botulinum spores on them. If you make canned juice, that's retorted to specifically take care of botulinum spores. But people want their juice fresh and minimally processed. Now, in this case, the juice was flash pasteurized. Is that going to take care of botulinum spores? No. So how do you control spore growth? You keep it cold. Temperature. What do you need for botulinum spores to germinate and cause problems? Room temperature and no oxygen. So I've got these bottles of juice, no oxygen, I got to keep it cold. All right. So what happened was there was a breakdown in the cold chain. I don't think seven people simultaneously mishandled it across North America. There was a breakdown in the cold chain somewhere for this company, Bold House Juice. But every year, this is for your barbecuing tip since it's so warm outside now and everyone's going to go barbecue. And you take baked potatoes and you put them on your barbecue and you wrap them in foil. The ones that you don't eat, what do you do with them? Pardon? Put them in the fridge, that would be one option. What else? Huh? Throw them away. <laughs> What you shouldn't do is leave them wrapped in foil at room temperature overnight. Because what's going to happen? I've created an anaerobic environment. If I've wrapped the foil tightly, there's going to be spores on the outside of that potato. They can germinate. So either put them in the fridge or take the foil off. Probably refrigerate it anyway. But every year someone ends up in a coma from eating potatoes that way. And so on. So we have lots of uh, information. Even dogs barf a lot. Oh, this is a good one. If you're going to slaughter a goat, don't do it in the back kitchen of your restaurant. It's very hard not to make a mess when you slaughter animals. And in this case, uh, the staff, the restaurant had closed for the night and the staff wanted some goat. They were of uh, uh, Arabic uh, descent, I guess. They slaughtered a goat, and within a week, something like 14 people who ate at that restaurant got E. coli that was traced back to the goat because they made such a mess slaughtering the goat in the back kitchen. It's a bad idea. Do, do, do. All right. And we actually videotape people, and we can show that these, this information has an effect, that it actually changes their behavior because that's really what we want to do is change behavior because that's what food safety culture is all about. All right. These are stickers for uh, those clamshells for takeout. We did this for a while. They were popular, but if you charge a penny, no one will pay for it. Everyone loves food safety as long as it's free. Other ways that people think about food safety culture, that's Jessica Simpson, but I don't care about that. I care about the A in the window. What is the A in the window telling me? That's the results of the restaurant inspection. And in Los Angeles, they use an ABC system, and you have to post it in the window. In Toronto, they use a red, yellow, green. What do they use in Manhattan? Actually, they write them up in the paper. And actually, there was a particularly nasty write-up of Rusty's last week, and a kid called me. And there's going to be a story in the Collegian next week about it. Did you see that write up? <laughs> Rusty's got hit with, I mean, it was bad. And Phoebus is saying it was that long. And it just listed all, they had, and it said at the bottom, I couldn't figure this out, it said several non critical violations. But I mean, what's a, the problem is every county defines a critical violation differently. So I don't know what was critical or not, but what I said to the reporter was, well, 20 mouse droppings is sort of an indicator of a problem because that's what they found. Ew, yeah. <laughs> In Denmark, they use smiley faces. <laughs> Do these things 
result in fewer people getting sick? No. Inspections are a snapshot in time, it's once a year. But do people talk about them, the results? Just like we are about Rusty's? And like forming images in our mind? Yes. And it starts people thinking about food safety more, so that's a good thing. That's how you impact culture. Unfortunately, food culture, the food safety bit, just like most people don't talk about microorganisms, United States culture is inundated in food porn. There is an excess amount of information about food that has nothing to do with safety, and it's essentially softcore pornography. And in fact, the photographic techniques are very similar with the soft filtered lenses and stuff. Go look at, watch the Food Network, and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's Paris Hilton eating a burger. Celebrity chefs. We did some research on this a few years ago and concluded that they made a mistake every four minutes on average. And they'd say, well, we do some of that stuff off camera, and I'd be like, well, maybe, except you're still doing really bad stuff. Cross-contamination was the worst, and all of them were equally bad. Of course, now everyone wants to eat local. And they say it's safer. Is it safer to eat local? No. No evidence at all. Is it safer to eat organic? No. No evidence at all. Dr. Phoebus and I are going to get beat up by people Monday night because <laughs> we're talking at a forum about organic food and everyone will want to, you know, bring it in. Those are lifestyle choices. I don't care what you do. But don't say that it's safer, because it's not. There's lots of, uh, this is a video of, this is an animal welfare issue, not a food safety issue, but it led to uh, a huge recall of meat. And uh, you hear about this all the time, where some kid gets hired on in a slaughterhouse, and they take their, uh, well, their Blackberry or their phone. I got video on here. I can videotape. And these big companies are always baffled that, you know, some kid is taking, they should know that the kids are going to do this. I mean, you can do this. This is what I think is very empowering for consumers, too. You can do this for restaurant stuff, and it happens every week. And any of you see the Domino's video last week? You can go on Barf Blog. You can go on, I think they pulled it from YouTube, but it's up there somewhere. Uh, two employees at a Domino's in North Carolina decided they'd have their 15 minutes of fame, so they videotaped themselves preparing pizzas, and they were doing things like taking the pepperoni and wiping it and then putting it on the pizza. <laughs> you never, you didn't hear about this? It was everywhere. Just go on Barf Blog and type in Domino's, and there's, there's links to the videos. Uh, these two were arrested for criminal charges. It all happened within a day. The whole, you know, the company didn't respond initially, and then it responded. They, were just, they thought they were being hilarious. Uh, two kids at a Dairy Queen in Newfoundland last year did the same thing, where they were running around naked, and the internal camera caught them. And they're like getting the food and doing this and then handing it to the drive through You can see on YouTube, you can see dancing rats and Taco Bells in New York City. Uh, Chinatown restaurants got shut down because people are taking pictures with their cell phones as they walk by. They see rats in the window. They go, that's not a good idea. Take a picture, email it to the health unit. Or better yet, just put it on YouTube and everyone can see. So you have a lot of power with these things. Some of the companies are figuring it out. Cargill just announced last week that they're going to start using video for animal welfare to improve their animal welfare. Now, USDA inspectors won't allow them to be videotaped for legal reasons, but in the rest of the plant, they're going to start using video. And I applaud that, because why be held hostage by some kid with a video camera? Why not do it yourself? I would argue the best companies will promote it. They'll brag about it. There's a plant in. North Dakota somewhere that makes deli meats. 
It has video cameras of anything, and you can go online and see the food being produced. And you can see the test results. It's all public, instead of hiding behind it. This is all marketing food safety. That is, not marketing, oh, it's natural, oh, it's local, or any of those things. Why not market food that is microbial, microbiologically safe? This is a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and on the lid it says food safety assurance. Now I don't know what that means, probably as much as the HACCP on the door at the cheese plant I talked about last time, but at least they're thinking about it and consumers want to know. This chicken on the left has a URL, and you can go online and see where the chicken was raised. Now that isn't really pushing microbiological safety. Those tomatoes that I showed you, I tried to get those guys to do that 10 years ago. I said, you're doing all this food safety stuff, why not brag about it? Most people don't care, but for those who do care, put a URL on the tomato and then they can go check it out. And we made a whole bunch of videos. We didn't know what to do with them because YouTube didn't exist then. But if you go on our YouTube site now, you'll find some videos from like 2001. I got hair down to here. I was thin too. And uh, <laughs> it's because I was playing hockey. I had good hockey hair, mullet. And... Uh, <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, I did have more teeth. <laughs> that wasn't hockey, unfortunately. Um, and so on. So if people, if you market food safety at retail and be much more open, no different than restaurant inspection results, then you actually demand more of the system and you demand more of the people. You know, this Peter Corporation of America stuff. So the other peanut butter producers, their sales are down 25% because people are just saying, ah, I think I'll stay away from the peanut crap for a while. So GIF took out these full page ads, and it says extensive product testing, including testing for salmonella, is a key part of our stringent quality assurance program. That's great, but there's a problem. When reporters ask them, will you make those test results public? The company said, no. <laughs> Go away. So they're not quite there yet. They got the right idea, but they're getting there. So to use all this food safety stuff and to take it to an industry level and give confidence to consumers, companies will not blame their consumers, customers. They won't charge more for food safety. You hear this all the time. I've been doing it this way all the time and I've never made anyone sick. Well, you don't know. And if you did kill them, they wouldn't be able to come back and complain. So we need safe food from safe sources, public disclosure of everything. We should have mandatory training. I don't know if any of you got training. To coach little girl, I coached girls hockey for 10 years. To coach little girls hockey, like six-year-olds, just to get behind the bench, you have to do an eight-hour course to know how to talk to parents who are jerks. <laughs> to be a coach, you got to do 16 hours. To do a travel team, which I did, I basically had 40 hours of training that I paid for. And I got a little card. That's to coach little girls hockey but I can make food and do nothing, and know nothing and kill you. Food safety is complex, it is constant, it requires commitment, and you must be compelling. And we won't do that. Uh, there's all the information, but that's all changing. All right, we got a few minutes left. Anyone want, want to talk about anything? You can always email me at any time, dpowell at KSU. You can go through Barth blog, I'm happy to talk food safety anytime. If you're interested in projects or stuff like that, just let me know. Don't call me. I never answer the phone. Email me. And don't Twitter me. <laughs>